we will move, the city will fall, empires will crumble, and a new empire will come on the scene with uh, a presentation by Dr. Yiftach Shalev, who is a senior research archaeologist at the Israel Antiquities Authority and a teaching fellow at Tel Aviv University. He is the co-director with Yuval of the uh, uh, Givati parking lot excavations in the city of David for the last five years and has done lots of work at lots of other excavations before that. So if you have other questions, you can pin him down at the break. So Yiftach, thank you. Okay, so thank you, Andrea. Thank you everyone for coming. And today we're going to speak, Yuval just talked about period in which Jerusalem is large and prospering. And we're going to speak now about the next period when Jerusalem lies in ruins. And uh, it is a very, very intriguing period. And the reason I added the asterisk to the title is because I wanted to extend it a little bit further than just uh, Persian period, I want to take this journey slightly into the Hellenistic period to show you more or less how the, the city changes through, uh, through the period. And we will do that um, by following archaeological remains from the excavation in uh, Givati parking lot. And I wanted to show you how we use these kinds of evidence to reconstruct uh, processes of uh, urbanism and development. Uh, but Jerusalem, we said before that every city is a gorgeous city. So again, yeah, Jerusalem is an amazing city, but it's got its own problems. And I'm not talking about the political ones. I'm talking about the problem of digging in a city which is still living. It's an, a city that people are living there. There are houses everywhere. You can just go and dig whenever you want. But that's common problem for all large cities in the world, and Jerusalem got its own special special enigma. And that enigma will be a dichotomy between text and finds. On the one hand, the city was or is excavated for more than 150 years, and we got plenty of finds, and we got plenty of uh, textual sources. But on the other hand, there are periods which are, which are well, basically, not there as far as archaeology go. We don't have archaeological remains to fit with what we know from, uh, from the text. And one of the best examples, or one of the good examples at least, for this kind of uh, dichotomy will be the Persian period. You can see from late 6th century and actually well into the, Hellenist, the early Hellenistic period, we do have white many finds that we find in excavation, pottery shirts, coins, stamp handle, but none of them seem to fit the story that we get from the biblical text. The Bible tells us about Jerusalem being large, fortified, urban settlement with many people and many structure. And in 150 years of archeology, span there's not a single wall or a single house in Jerusalem that we can well date to this period. We can't say that this house is from the 5th century or 4th century or, or even 3rd century BC. So we got this huge gap in the archaeology of Jerusalem that doesn't fit history. So I said before, Jerusalem has been dug for almost 150 years. And you can see here, uh, more or less, where most excavation were conducted. And this is the southeastern ridge commonly known as the city of David. You can see the mark, yeah. And most excavation conducted here or on the eastern slope in Shiloh's area E and D or area G. And what's marked in yellow is the places where most finds from Persian period were found so far. And all of them were found in soil layers and connected to, uh, to architecture. So besides for us to know that something happened in Jerusalem during that day, that, during that period, there's very little we can say about the city itself. And most scholars uh, believe that after the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC, Jerusalem became really small, poor settlement, narrowing down to this 
tiny area that you can see here marked in red, and it stayed like that, tiny and unimportant settlement, till the days of the Hashmonian kings in the late second century BCE. And that problem, the lack of architecture, the lack of knowledge led scholars to suggest different reconstruction for the city. Uh, it starts from what I call the maximalist, basically saying that the city was as large as it used to be during the Iron Age, but the reason that we don't find remains from uh, these periods is because it was relatively unbuilt and st structure was scattered along the, around the place. And since we are digging in tiny places, we just don't find these structures. I think that almost none, no archaeologists today go with that scenario, but it still exists. Most scholars, as I said before, believe the city was tiny, either stretches all along the southeastern ridge, the city of David, maybe even slightly smaller, just at the middle of the ridge. And several years ago, a suggestion by Salfin Kesten of the Lifshitz and Ido Koch uh, claimed that we're not looking in the right place and the city is actually on the top of uh, Mount Moriah. But nevertheless, it's still small, it's still relatively poor. This picture or this gap in our knowledge is starting to shrink or to narrow down during recent, uh, because of the recent excavation. And we're gonna start here with the excavation of Eilat Mazar below that tower that you see here in area G, you saw the map before. Uh, while excavating there, Eilat thought that the tower itself is part of Nehemiah's wall, but I think most scholars, including myself, date this to a much later period. But the most important thing was that while uh, excavating below the tower, a light exposed several soil layer line one on top of the other, giving us a really nice sequence of uh, deposits. And while uh, studying the pottery from uh, these layers, we realized that we can uh, distinguish for the first time between three different horizons. We can see development in the pottery during that period, and you can see the lower one the very well common pottery of the late Iron Age, more or less the, the, the period where Yuval was talking about, and the green mark, the layer of destruction, this is the city from the Iron Age that was destructed. Above it, much above it in red, is the pottery that we usually recognize as belong to the Persian period, 5th and 4th century BCE, but while spreading the pottery on the table, we realized that there is something in between that was not known uh, before. And you can see here that some of the vessels are still this reddish, similar to what we know from Iron Age. Others are more yellowish of what we know from the Persian. Some types are still Iron Age types, sometimes are slightly new. Something is going on that we never recognized uh, before. And the Aura Freud start studying uh, the pottery from uh, these layers and uh, comparing them to other pottery uh, corpuses that we see in other places, Ramat Rachel and other, uh, other sites. And for the first time, we could pinpoint some kind of a development through the history of Jerusalem. Now, I know that for most people here, talking about pottery is boring, sorry, Becky Andrea. <laughs> but it holds potential for us to understand the development of the city. So first, we got here an evident that the city was never totally abandoned because you see development in the material culture. It goes slowly, changes slowly. There's no, no real break. So we know for, example, for sure that people were still living in Jerusalem after the destruction and slowly, slowly the city start to develop. So that was a good start. Uh, and in the recent years, the excavation by uh, Yuval Gadot and myself in Givati parking lot, and you can see here uh, the site just to the south of the Temple Mount. And while digging uh, at that site, we found a structure. Yuval just showed you a picture of some finds from that structure. A relatively large building, about 70 meter wide. It's relatively big, two-story high, or at least two-story high, 
And this building is dated to the late Iron Age, the late First Temple period. This is exactly the destruction that we talked about. And it's quite massive structure, but what was important for us is the massive destruction that this building went through, most probably during the Babylonian destruction in 586 BCE by the Babylonian. And you can see here remains of the ash and the burnt beams. And especially I want you to see this pile of debris that totally fill the lower uh, rooms of that structure. So finding this structure that was again destroyed was a nice find, but what was really, really amazing for us is when we understood that it was not left in ruins and people just went away. It was reused slightly later on during the Persian period. And you can see here marking, well, blue or purple, purple. Let's keep changing according to screens. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see here some remains of small architecture, poor architecture, but that was clearly dated to the Persian period. So we got here tiny walls, you can see them here, more or less terrace wall, very poorly constructed, but they were there. And we got a chamber here that someone built right at the corner of the building that was destroyed before. And more or less, you can see it here clearly. There are the rooms filled with destruction, way too many stones for someone to move them around. But here for the north, Something happened, apparently there were less debris or something like that, and people came back to this destructed house, cleared the debris, built this tiny terrace wall to hold the pile of stone right to the north and settle down within the ruined structure. So try to imagine this picture of a totally destructed city, destroyed city, houses in ruins, and people are coming back and they choose specifically not to go and build a house on another hill somewhere far away. They are going back to the destructed house, to the destroyed house, in a particular reason to resettle within these, uh, these structures. Maybe it's a memory that they kept with them while being in exile. Maybe these are uh, other people that are coming back, but this, how did you call it, the long Jewish memory? <laughs> So people remember the houses in this destroyed city and are coming back. And now when we found it over for the first time, we weren't sure if what we see is just a one-time event. So we went back and start looking for other evidence in other uh, uh, excavation report. And you can see here excavation in area E at the other side of the city of David an excavation by Eagle Shiloh at the, uh, uh, 1980s and Eagle Shiloh found this nice house, nice big house from the late Iron Age, but he also noticed that there are small construction from the Persian period. And you can see here someone is making a nice pavement and arranging a new uh, chamber somewhere. So we got here a pattern. It's not just this one house at Givati. You can see it everywhere in, oh, everywhere. at least in two cases at the city, but this is the idea, to come back to the destroyed city and to resettle within the destruction. Uh, Sharon Zuckerman, when she worked on a destructed site, she uh, made this term that called crisis architecture, which is usually connected to what people are doing before destruction, how they reshape the space to cope with the stress. They know that something is going on, an army is coming or something like that, and you arrange your space to fit your needs uh, compare, uh, waiting for this uh, destruction. I think we can reuse this also to talk about post-destruction. People are coming to this, uh, to the area, they need now to settle down and they rearrange the, the, the space, they rearrange the architecture to fit their needs. And we can see perfect example from modern time, just to show you uh, two examples. So we got here on the left, a picture of people at Nepal after the earthquake. They can't wait for the government to come and rebuild their houses. So they start doing them by themselves, a wall by wall. And on the other hand, 
people at Aferin in Syria, refugees that ran away from one of the uh, bombed city, and they are running away to another destroyed city and resettled within the destruction. So it's something that happens uh, even in modern time, and we can now, I think, see it, how it uh, happened back then, and maybe, just maybe, this is the reality behind the story of the late uh, travel of the Hamaya that is walking around and see the city uh, in ruins. Uh, so when we understood that for the first time we can actually picture Persian period Jerusalem, we continue to look in other evidence and Leora Freud resampled pottery from previous excavation in Givati parking lot by Doran Ben Ami and she realized that she can find the same phenomenon in a structure that he dug before and two layers that he dated to the Iron Age are actually from the Persian period and you can see here on the plan the same thing they're reusing the house they're rebuilding wall above a wall it's not something new People are coming to the destroyed city again, just try to imagine this picture and reshaping uh, the area. Uh, so uh, while doing all this, we start expanding the, the, the excavation, looking for more evidence. And you can see here the location of our uh, Iron Age structure with the Persian uh, construction. You can see here where the Ron Ben Ami had his own construction. And we went a little bit up the slope and you can see here this massive uh, rock, but these fields here below are all dated to the early uh, horizon of pottery to the late 6th century. So we got evidence from the late 6th, from the late 5th, and when we put it all together, we got a nice map of what's going on in Jerusalem. So in, in yellow, you can see the places where we got pottery that is dated to the late 6th uh, century BC, as I said before, only in soil layer. So it seems, and it's right on the top of the ridge, as if this is, this is the garbage that was tossed from the city that was on top of the ridge down. And slightly later, and these are the, the, the blue stars, we can see construction, poorly, construct, poorly built construction or poorly built houses and pottery, which is slightly date later, from the 5th century BC. So you can start to see how the city moved from a total destruction. People are coming back, they resettle on top of the ridge. There are still very few. They're, they settle with this tiny place. Half a century later, something is going on, and they start expanding around uh, 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 and enlarging the city. But the city is not as poor as we think. Economy rise up, trade start, and you can see here some uh, evidence, for example, this nice best vessel, which we usually find along the coast. But someone knew about this Phoenician or Egyptian type of vessel, and it didn't brought it to Jerusalem. It was manufactured in Jerusalem. So you see a nice connection now between the city and the coast. And even a better example are the ver uh, large amount of fish bones that we found in these Persian layers. So, as I said before, we can see that when the city start to expand, also its economic relation start to rise, and we can see trade. And if you got fish in Jerusalem, it means that people got enough money to pay for fish that come from the coast. So you can see again how the city become stronger and stronger by the day. And this process continue into the early Hellenistic period. And now we're talking about this orange and we got another structure that was built right on top of our Iron Age uh, destructed, destroyed house. And once again, this house is not a small dwelling. It's 17, 17 meter long. It's a very large house built with ashlers and we got quite many small finds inside it to indicate the rank of the people who live there, including some golden earrings, gold jewelry, and quite many uh, bula that used to, used to seal letters or uh, other things. And these bulas are well known from other Seleucid centers, such as Telitz Taba and other places. 
Uh, so you can see how the city again moved from total destruction to small settlement to slightly larger settlement and now moving on into a uh, well, roy royal neighborhood, if you like. So the process go on and the, the gap that we had from 586 BCE till, I don't know, 120 more or less, is now shrinking down just by following pottery uh, tradition, just by following really small pieces of evidence, we can see the whole process of development in the city. So to sum up, to stay in the time limits, <laughs> uh, you can see now the, that the city is no longer in ruins in the early Hellenistic city. We keep finding evidence of construction everywhere in Givati. There's a total new neighborhood. It's not just one structure. And as I said before, the archeological gap is narrowing down. We can see that during the Babylonian period after the destruction, the city was not totally abandoned. People were still living there. The city is in ruin, but we can see uh, people are still living on top of the uh, uh, of the ridge of the ancient core of the city during the fifth century resettling within the ruined city people are coming back to live there the city extending next uh, westward it's definitely larger than any of us thought before during the fifth century economy rise up the city becomes stronger and stronger until during the Seleucid period we already got a totally new city, much stronger, much better built than we ever uh, imagined before. And next will be the Hellenistic period. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very, very much. You stay here and uh, we'll, we'll get questions, Steve. Thank you. I wonder, outside of the Tanakh, is there any named evidence for Ezra or Nehemiah? Uh, no, not yet. There is actually a huge debate if the people, Ezra and Nehemiah, are real ones. But so far, there's not a single shared or, uh, or Bula or Seal or anything like that that mention one of these names. So, no, we don't know. Yeah. that. You can be next. Hi, um, very interesting um, conference. I'm working on Mesoamerica in Teotihuacan, and that's funny because we are seeing exactly the same process. After the city was burned and abandoned, in fact, it wasn't abandoned, and the people resettled the abandonment in in a real way, you know, and. When we are looking in the houses, we, are, we see, uh, we see um, the same evidence in architecture that you saw, that they are living in the same houses, but they don't occupy the entire um, area, just some, um, I don't know, spaces, and they made small walls. And, you know, we are seeing exactly the same, but in different parts of the world. So I think that's very interesting to um, see the cities when the cities are abandoned and they have some functions and they are ruined but live. But the difference between Jerusalem and, uh, and Teotihuacan is that you mentioned that they lived in the core center of the, you know, the first city. What we are seeing us is that they are living in the periphery, not in the epicenter. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, that's cool. But my question is the that you show us it's all the time they are resettling um, households, but do you see that also in public structures or ceremonial structures? Okay, so uh, first of all, th thank you. It's, it's it's actually amazing to see that you can see the same behavior everywhere else. Uh, I think it it seems reasonable when you think about it because this is human behavior in a way, but. Thank you for reinforcing my, my thought. Uh, about uh, ceremonial or public structure, we, we don't have those in Jerusalem yet. I, I mentioned before that up till, well, 
10 years, we didn't have even a single war from in Jerusalem that we can date it to, to the Persians. So the fact that now we got this small uh, construction is, is a huge miracle as far as, far as we're concerned. There's, there was yet, uh, there was no, no house that we can say are ceremonial or uh, actually public. This, even the story about the, the wall of Nehemiah that seems like something that we should have found. So, so far, no, there, there, there are no walls in Jerusalem that we can date for that period. So it seems that the town was indeed very, very small and poor, at least during the first stages of the Persian period. Uh, but this is archaeology, so maybe in 10 years from now, maybe we'll know something new. Um, so I, I want to ask about the uh, pottery shards that you found um, in terms of the different layers. Uh, you, t you said about like, um, like the, you kind of group them with like different colors with like the red, uh, like toned pottery and like the green toned pottery. Um, and then you talked about like this, this different layer in between that you that you're not sure about where which um, mm -hmm. period these the shards came from or if it's a totally different. Uh, I, I want to ask, like, how are you able to, like, tell that, like, these are completely different? Because, like, from my standpoint, from my viewpoint here, they look kind of similar to the others. Okay. Um, so, like, yeah. So, we, we, <laughs> first, so, you write. So, like, how, how are you, like, able to, like, tell that, like, th this <laughs> is a totally different layer, and then this may be coming from, like, a totally different period? Okay. So, <laughs> it's pottery, so it's hard. Okay. Uh, but but uh, when you the first time that we realize that we, we see here this development is when it was all lying down on the table because when you look something on sometimes when you look on specific shirt or specific evidence you got this picture but when you put all this together you you can see how it how it changed within time so and later on and and when uh, Leova start uh, working on her material we can actually see how some types just disappeared the moment you move up within these layers and some new types start to appear so you can actually see how these changes are, uh, are, are occurring and it's a very specific word you work you can actually need to to follow it tab by tab and to see what, how it changed during the time and you can also see that in the middle while working on it where is it uh, when we worked on this uh, horizon, you see that you get vessels which are still Iron Age tradition, but they are now made with new type of clay. So something is starting to change. In the uh, in the Persian period, everything will be now made with the new type of clay. So so you can act. You you can really follow these changes in time and to see how people are, are they still remember the old tradition but they move on with new technique, new technology, new clay sources. So, so yeah, so you just need to see the whole picture in, in, in order to follow those uh, footprint. We did have a couple more questions, but I'm gonna kick you out because, <laughs> <laughs> because you've made such a compelling uh, hope-filled story here and we need to get to the next chapter. So